good morning. Good morning. How are you, Sarah? I'm doing really well. I'm just going to close my laptop down now that we've uh, established <laughs> a good connection. Sure thing. And oh, it's great to be joining you here on Stories for Earth today. Thank you very much for inviting me. Yeah, thank you for joining me. Um, I'm very excited to have you here on our first Instagram live stream. So I think this will be great. Yeah, I, I love the I love the idea of being part of your premiere. That's really a great honor. Thank you very much. Yeah, of course. And also, congratulations on your new book. That's awesome. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you. Um, so for everyone who's just now joining, um, my name is Forrest Brown. I'm the founder of Stories for Earth. And today I'm joined by Sarah Holding, who is a Cli-Fi young adult author from the UK. Sarah, thank you for joining us. My pleasure. Awesome. Uh, well, I guess we can dive right in. I'm going to ask Sarah a few questions, and then she'll actually be sharing a reading um, from her new book, Chameleon. And then uh, we'll follow up with a few questions after that. And then if anybody has questions at the end, you're welcome to post them in here. So get started. Um, so before we dive into talking specifics about your new book, Chameleon, um, I wanted to ask you just about being a cli-fi author in general. Um, I know that your previous it was a trilogy, actually, the Sea Bean trilogy, um, also used fiction as a medium for discussing climate change. Um, mm -hmm. So I'm curious, like, what draws you to that topic? And why do you see fiction as a powerful vehicle for talking about climate change? Well, um, as I see it, I think there, there may be more, but as I see it, there are three basic story types um, in literature. There's uh, the sort of man against man, um, man against uh, self, um, so you're kind of, you know, doing kind of uh, struggle, internal struggle, if you like, and, and man against nature or, or kind of character against nature, let's say more specifically character against character, character against self. And um, I think historically with, with, with character against nature, usually the character is the victim of some terrible thing that's happening. So if you take, I don't know, Jaws, for example, or mm -hmm. something where it's, it's, it's kind of like a volcano exploding or what, one of those disaster movies, then, then the character is, is at, at the mercy of, of the kind of circumstances taking place unfolding in nature and has to do battle with that and has to kind of, you know, survive. So it's a kind of, I don't know, David and Goliath type thing as well. Um, but with climate change, it's really interesting because then who is the victim? Is it is right. it nature or is it the character? Huh. Um, is it the you know is it the human characters or is it the animal characters or is it is it the whole kind of you know natural kingdom? So then we become you know kind of embroiled in our own problem. So then it's also something about character against uh, character against self comes into play because right. it's like how could I have done this to my planet? Um, mm. And then it's also you know, character against character, because there are going to be different, there's going to be a conflict about how to cope with the, the problem that's taking place with the climate change. So I just think it's very rich. It kind of involves all of those typologies, if you like. Um, it's also yeah. a really great one for building as a backdrop. You know, I mean, I don't see it as a backdrop. I see it as integral. But some people might see that climate change fiction creates a very strong kind of um, forceful pressurizing backdrop, if you like, for building rising action in the story. And um, so, you know, because it can take different phases, I guess, a climate change scenario can build up from something very small and kind of almost unnoticeable to begin with into something absolutely, you know, staring you in the face. So you can kind of deal with quite a lot of sort of, you know, notch, you know, sort of the notches of kind of building it up can be quite good in terms of scaling up the, the intensity. And then also, I think the main thing is why I find it really rewarding to do, especially when I've gone into schools and they find that climate change is something that they've only really engaged with in science lessons. Um, and it's very much about energy efficiency and recycling and all those sorts of, you know, initiatives. But they don't really deal with the kind of cost of the conflict and they don't speculate beyond what's really facing us right now. So it gives you a chance to kind of you know, uh, big, it, big it up into a much more kind of dramatic and um, much, much bigger consequences, much, much more at stake, if you like, when you deal with climate change in a literary setting. Mm, that's interesting. And yeah, I thought I'd seen that you um, were going into schools and doing readings there. So um, that kind of ties into my next question, which is about um, like why a young adult audience? Um, I know that um, like in particular, uh, a lot of children are very worried about climate change right now, um, younger generations especially. And we've seen, you know, like everything that Greta Thunberg is doing with the, um, mm -hmm. you know, Fridays for Future and the children's climate strike movement. Um, why did you decide to write to a young adult audience? Well, my previous book um, was was a middle grade title um, and I didn't really know what the age bracket of the book was. Somebody said to me, just write the story you've got to write and then we'll figure out what the age 
what the age bracket is when it's done. Right. And um, partly because the protagonist was a little younger. She was only 11. And that was because I wanted her to still be on her home island of St. Kilda and not have gone to uh, high school at that point. So it was sort of slightly determined by that. So I didn't, I didn't choose to write for middle grade in the same way as with this book. I didn't necessarily choose to write for, for YA, but I realised that the characters I was, um, I was going to be involved with were in their late, mid to late teens. Sure. Um, and so they had a lot more kind of complexity to them than my previous protagonist. Um, so the, the characters Cam, Mel and Leon, um, although they're genetically modified, so they're sort of created, if you like, they don't really have an age, but nominally, let's say they are teenagers. Okay. So that was one reason. Um, some of the issues I'm dealing with are a little bit more bleak and a little bit kind of more out there than the, the a middle grade reader could handle. Sure. So then I realised I was dealing with a story that was a bit for a bit of an older older reader. Mm. Uh, my own kids, who are sort of partly my target audience, had also got got a bit older <laughs> and yeah. were in that age bracket themselves. So it was sort of aiming it kind of at them as well. You know, I think you're very tuned into what the age of your children's mindset is and, and so as they got older I realised I was tuning into that way of looking at the world and they're interested in, as you mentioned Greta Thunberg and the whole kind mm -hmm. of climate emergency extinction rebellion all of those things were kicking off all of that has happened since Seabean came out so in a way right. um, I feel I was at the sort of front of the curve um, writing at that time and now um, I've got to kind of you know ride that wave really and it's been yeah. very exciting um, but at the same time, and, and also, you know, there's a sense of urgency, I guess, in that age group um, that they are going to come to the fore. You know, the, the the kind of the readers of YA right now are going to be the leaders of tomorrow and they're going to be the ones having to make decisions about how we get ourselves out of this mess, really. So it right. seems only right that I would address a piece of fiction that is helping them think that through, if you like, and speculate about it to to that age group. Yeah, that's super cool. And uh, I'm sure it is definitely interesting uh that you had children who were growing up among all of this and sort of writing to their perspective as well. Um, so speaking to the story of the book, I know that Chameleon takes place, I think you said 14,000 years ago, am I right? Yeah, kind of 12,000, um, so 10,000 BC, yeah. Gotcha, okay. So it takes place a very long time ago. Um, a very long time. In Atlantis. Um, could you tell us a little bit more about the story and what inspired you to write it? Hmm. So again, going back to going into schools, um, when I published uh, Seabean, I think I thought initially, because I didn't know it was Clifi, I didn't even know the genre until a few weeks <laughs> into the book, the book had come mm -hmm. out. But I used to characterise it as science fiction because, you know, as far as I was yeah. concerned, I'd written a time travel device that happened to have a bit of a kind of ecological agenda to it, a time travel mm -hmm. adventure story. So yeah. when I told the children in schools, oh, well, yes, I've written um, science fiction, they would say, oh, fantastic, you know, space and aliens. Is it about space and aliens? And then I'd have to go all apologetic and say, no, I'm really sorry. It's, it's sci-fi, but there's no space and there's no aliens. But it really got me thinking because I thought, OK, well, I'm really into sci-fi myself. I, I watch a lot of sci-fi movies. Yeah. And um, I was thinking, but may, why am I not drawn to writing a story that specifically involves, you know, beings from outer space and, you know, um, and, and that kind of perspective? Mm. So I was, it, it got me thinking anyway, what would I what would I write if I was to propose to myself that I was going to write with that sort of subject matter? How would it how would it sit with me? So that mm. was one thing. Um, I think another thing was. Um, uh, you know, wanting to kind of delve into our ancient past a bit more. I've always been curious, you know, I'd been reading a lot of um, stuff. I've been watching a lot of ancient aliens episodes. Um, <laughs> yeah. And I'd and I'd always been curious about Atlantis, you know, and I'd always felt mm -hmm. that it was a real place and um, not just some mythical made up land. And I, I kind yeah. of always felt a little bit irritated by anything that sort of tried to trivialise it or Disneyfy it or kind of make it into just some kind of wondrous fantasy thing because as far as I'm concerned I'm really not writing fantasy fiction here you know mm -hmm. this is as realistic as I could get it okay um yeah. and uh and, and as far as you know it's, it's historical it's historical fiction albeit mm -hmm. so long ago you can't verify the historical veracity of it sure sure yeah and I think it's cool that you decided to take a sort of historical fiction approach to writing about climate change because typically we always see it as like um speculative fiction well, I guess this could also fall into that category but you know it's always kind of like near distant future type of scenarios mm -hmm. like I think of Octavia Butler's like Parable of the Sower it I think it actually takes place like in the 2050s um so not too far away from where we are um mm -hmm. but yeah so it's really cool that you decided to kind of go back in time actually because we know that the climate has changed 
you know, over time, but it's just right now it's changing extremely rapidly, like much faster than it ever has mm -hmm. changed before. So mm -hmm. go back and look at one of those periods where it has sort of happened in the past is a really cool way to look at that, I think. Thank um, you. Yeah. So if you're, um, if you're still willing to do it, um, I'd love to hear a little bit from Atlantis, uh, or excuse me, from Chameleon. Um, do you have anything you'd like to read to us? I do, yeah. So um, I need an extra pair of hands now. I'm going to read oh. from my <laughs> read from my Kindle, um, okay. and the bit I'm going to read. To, well, I, I might read two bits. We'll just see how we're doing for yeah, time. Yeah. You can tell me how we're doing for time. So the bit that okay. I picked out to read is when. Um, so the three main characters are Cam, Mel, and Leon, right? Okay. Mm -hmm. So you don't meet them in that order. You meet Leon first, and then you then you meet Mel, and um, finally, um, after she's been mentioned a few times, you meet Cam, mm -hmm. and. Cam is the character that is sort of the alien, if you like, in the story. She comes from another planet, another solar system. She comes from uh, a planet that orbits around the star Sirius. Okay. And um, she's uh, kind of got herself recruited to a mission that she doesn't really know anything about. It just seems like a huge kind of adventure to her. Um, and her, her, her dad hasn't come back from his latest work, uh, work contract. So she's sort of kind of wanting to go to, on this mission to Earth because she knows he's there and she maybe could find him and bring him, bring him back. Okay. Um, so there's sort of bit of an ulterior motive for her she doesn't sense of why she's doing it other than to get out of a few things she doesn't want to be doing on her home planet mm -hmm. and eventually you know after quite a long journey arrives arrives um, at earth and they've been recruited on what is to all intents and purposes an all risks mission that then gets upgraded to a mercy mission to earth so they know something's gone horribly wrong but until she gets a briefing when they arrive on the moon she doesn't really know what the mission is and what her role in that mission is going to be but it turns out she's been assigned to arrive in atlantis and to conduct some sort of um, covert surveillance operation um, but it's not clear what the circumstances are going to be. They've kind of got wind of the fact that situation's got a bit out of control down there, but they don't really know why at that point. So um, mm. they've, they've arrived and they're skimming over the surface of the earth around the location that they've been given the coordinates for, for, um, for where Atlantis is, but they can't find any sight, you know, sight or sound of it. Um, and then eventually they realise that these kind of slight um, indentations in the mud in on the ground below them is probably all that's left of the city of Atlantis and that it's it's been kind of washed away by a kind of slew of mud and a big tsunami and so on and so forth don't know what's they don't quite know what's happened um, and then they've been told well you know they've got they've got to kind of continue their mission but in a different it's, it's having to be reframed what their role in the mission is so this is the, the point in the story um where where it picks up that i'm going to read to you and um just to give you a bit of a heads up then about the two the two or three characters that we're going to be meeting um so it's cam whose voice is telling this story and okay. the reason that the story has come to light in the modern day is that they found a series of these strange discs that they initially thought was um some sort of ancient necklace um, but in fact, encoded onto each of these discs was a, a kind of part of a log that the character Cam had made uh, mm -hmm. using using her bot. So her bot is called Zep, and he's a kind of AI that accompanies her on the mission. Mm -hmm. And so somebody in the modern day finds these beads from a necklace and then discovers that encoded onto them, there are these pieces of information. And... Um, uh, the mission is being launched by somebody called Captain Tahuti, who's a giant, um, and Zep is the AI bot, and uh, she's about to find Mel for the first time. Okay, cool. Zep woke me to tell me we've been ordered by Captain Tahuti to abort our mission. What does that mean, that we have to go back to the moon, go back to Nyantolo? No, Captain Tahuti says he's got what he needed from us about the state of Atlantis. He wants us to stay down here and carry out extensive aerial surveillance. He wants me to compile a data file on the exact number of survivors left on the surface and to log the direction in which they are moving. He has forbidden us to perform search and rescue, just surveillance for now. He is sending down two more AI-controlled Vimanas, which have gold cladding like ours, to withstand Earth's volatile atmosphere, and they will be covering the area to the north of us. We've been assigned a wide band that stretches east to west, all the way from the ruins of the Atlantean archipelago as far as Kem. Can you show me a visual? Zep projected an animated map of a massive green area of land covered with towns, farms and villages that was smothered with a mixture of ash, mud, sand and debris where the tsunami swept through. 
what exactly are we looking for? There's nothing there. Surely nothing, surely no one has survived, I blurted out loud as the extent of the damage finally dawned on me. I know it seems pointless, Cam, but our orders are to scan the whole area for Atlantean refugees. If we find any, Captain Tahuti wants me to report it immediately. We are only allowed to intervene if war breaks out. How many people lived in Atlantis before it was destroyed? 144,000, but according to Tahuti's last update, the majority of them died before they even had a chance to leave the city. How? After news got round that the king and queen had been killed by the rebel Draco army, riots broke out, and the next day there was a huge earthquake followed by a massive tsunami. A thousand or so survivors were rescued by the Dogon and taken into the mountains, but it's likely that most of them have now also perished, either due to fierce storms, earthquakes, or stampedes of fleeing animals. There are new risks every day. Right now, a giant rift valley has opened up, running north to south across the landmass, splitting it in two. If there are any refugees on the move, it will block their progress as they move east. Our mission is simply to observe. We cannot risk being detected at this time. Those are Tahuti's orders. You mean we're not allowed to help these poor people in any way? That seems so heartless, Zet. Standard operating procedure, Cam, Nazar butted in. I've been tracking your Vimana for days, but it was only when the ship started emitting the Mayday signal that I was allowed to make contact with you and intervene. I see, but it, it still doesn't seem right. I mean, it was the Dogon people who made contact with us Syrians, so it's not as if the people down there don't know we exist. Orders are orders, Cam, Zep said obstinately, putting the Vimana into cloaked mode. Nazar assumed night duty on the bridge and I retired to my hammock with Om. We flew for days skimming the surface of the desolate continent, looking for anyone or anything that was moving or alive. There were dried up lake beds where herds of animals had died where they got trapped in the mud trying to find water. We saw deserted towns and villages that were still flooded up to their thatched rooftops. Forests flattened by storms or consumed by fire and thick smoke. And strange circular holes where the ground had been impacted by something or had just caved in. The only places that were left unscathed by Earth's rapidly deteriorating climate had also been abandoned by whoever had once lived there, leaving crops unharvested in the fields and small enclosures where a few farm animals still wandered around, untended and unfed. During my watch, the Fumana slowly drifted over the snowy peaks of a mountain range and as we descended on the other side, up ahead I saw a giant rift valley that Zepp had mentioned. It was like a jagged scar where the skin of the earth had been ripped open to reveal its guts. We dropped a little lower and tracked back, following, following Zep's grid meticulously. And finally I detected something moving, something alive. It turned out to be a column of several hundred people descending from a steep mountain pass. Among them, a few camels, the animals with humps that Colonel Askew had talked about, and two other beasts with long trunks that Zep's data files identified as pachyderms, commonly known as elephants. Wake up, guys, look, I yelled to Nazar and Om, who were both taking a nap. Zep steadily piloted the Vimana until we were overhead, and we followed the column's progress for several hours until they came to a small lake, which Zep's files identified as Lake Gabero. I think we should help them. It's not necessary. They look like they know what they're doing. But they're not going to be able to make it across the rift, Nazar, I argued. They're not at war, Cam. We can't help them. I don't care. These might be the only people left alive on the whole planet. Don't you think we should at least know them what, let them know what's up ahead? Captain Tahuti has forbidden us to approach anyone, said Zep mechanically. Listen, Zep, I know you're programmed to follow rules, but this is a mercy mission. I say we show those people down there some mercy. No one spoke after my little outburst, but to my surprise, Zep step, uh, Nazar ste step, <laughs> to my surprise, Nazar stepped up to Zep and put him into shutdown mode, and then reset the controls to put the Vimana into limbo over the lake. Better put on our spacesuits before we go down, she advised. <laughs> the UV portal opened up. On went first, and then Nazar and I jumped down into the water after him. When we surfaced, bobbing in our large semicircular helmets, I saw a long line of dark, sombre faces staring at us from the water's edge. I swam towards them, hoping they'd try not to attack us, hoping they would not try to attack us, because I had no weapon and it would be impossible to run in the suits. 
To be honest, they looked utterly worn out rather than aggressive. It looked as if they'd seen just about everything and our arrival from the sky in a strange spaceship was nothing out of the ordinary. There was some murmuring and pointing from the younger ones and the camels shied away, but the tallest and the eldest stood their ground and waited patiently to see who we were and why we'd come. A short distance from the shore, I stopped swimming and floated in the water, waiting for N Nazar and Om to catch up. There were just two elephants. A little black girl was riding the smaller one and a young woman who could have been her older sister was on the larger. She, wa she wore a strange hooded cloak, rather like the one I'd seen the Dogon chief wearing when he met with the Syrian High Council. A large group stood huddled around the woman on the larger ele elephant and I took that to mean she was their leader. Once the water was shallow enough to stand up, I began to wade out to meet them, thinking that the sight of another regular biped would put them at ease. The young woman on the larger elephant nudged her animal forward and, dropped fo and she dropped the hood of her cloak to her shoulders. She had dark skin and black hair tied up in an elaborate style and held her hand above her eyes to get a better look at us as we approached. I looked back at Nazar and realised that with our helmets and breathing equipment on, we looked as if we had trunks too, just like elephants. <clears throat> I decided to respond to the woman's gesture by removing my helmet, even though Zepp had warned me not to. I held it by my side and waded to the water's edge. I could feel a cold wind moving over my stubbly ceph, and I was suddenly conscious of my white skin. Worse still, now that I wasn't breathing through my suit, the gills in my neck were opening up and I was starting to turn blue. I willed myself to regain control of my body and then walked up, the, up to the leader with a smile on my face. There was total silence among the people as I approached. The young woman slid elegantly down her elephant's neck, then took off the cloak and handed it to someone standing behind her. As she dusted herself down, I noticed she was wearing a loose-fitting, ragged blue dress. But it wasn't the only thing that was blue. When I stood within arm's reach of her, I saw that she had vivid blue eyes. I took another step forward with Nazar and Om right behind me. Was this the person in Pa's file, the one he'd placed in the Royal Palace for field testing? Had she fled all the way from Atlantis with these people? Mel? I asked softly. She looked confused for a moment and turned to the woman standing just behind her as if needing her support. The latter shrugged as she helped the little girl down from the other elephant. Then the young woman with the blue eyes turned back to face me. Leon, she replied in a silent voice in my ceph. So that's, that's the end of that chapter. Um, and obviously um, there's a lot of explaining to be done and a lot of um, kind of figuring out who's who and what's what um, between the two of those characters. Um, because Mel has heard of Leon and... Mm -hmm. um, and thinks because Cam has actually had her head shaved when she arrived in at the moon, she went through a kind of profiling in toxicology, which required her to have her head shaved. Mm -hmm. um, that, so she doesn't even she doesn't even have her red hair anymore. So uh, she kind of looks a bit more like a boy. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so there's some kind of amusing kind of confusion there. But um, it's it's the bit in the story where you most get a sense of the the climate change having taken yeah. place across a wide part of the african subcontinent basically mm -hmm. yeah that's do awesome you, do, you have time, do, you have time, <laughs> do you have time for me to, to to read a little bit of the interview at the end of the story as well of course please okay because um this is so the the kind of framing device that i've used is that these there's an archaeologist who's come across not just these uh, Syrian discs that I mentioned but also two other archaeological finds and one was some clay tablets found underneath the Sphinx in Giza in Egypt sure. um, which they which they called the the, um, the the scrolls and then the other the other the other um, uh, find was in the in the region of Mali they found these um, another account another ancient document and they realized that the three documents between them described a similar set of events and uh, the same set of characters. And so she contacts this climate scientist because she realizes that the, the kind of gist of the story is that something very, very dramatic happened to, during that time that seems to amount to climate change. And she wants to, she doesn't know much about it because she's just an archeologist. So by the end of the story, the two of them, he's a bit resistant to get involved at first because he thinks she's been um, taken in by, by a sort of hoax really. But gradually she convinces him that these documents are legitimate 
and then uh, they start to kind of work together and there's an interview a sort of uh, set into the near future at the end of the story where it's obvious that they've not only collaborated but they've also put together an amazing exhibition about mm. their work and their findings and so on the eve of this exhibition this sort of climate change summit they're, they're being interviewed um, so the, the, the article is a sort of standalone piece at the end of the story called What on Earth Can Atlantis Teach Us? <laughs> okay. And uh, it's between the two, the two academics then, Dr. Camille Warden, the archaeologist, and Professor mm. Ian Cliff, who's the, the climate scientist. And it's uh, dated, I gave it the date, uh, 29th of February 2024. So we're talking four years into the future. You see, we all think right. is this at all possible. <laughs> this is what the fun part <laughs> It's abundantly clear that we're struggling to cope with the effects of climate change on our planet, not least because we're still arguing about its root cause. We urgently need to focus instead on how we're going to cope with the devasti devastating impact of climate change. To do this, we need to open our minds to what is staring us in the face for a very long time. Two brave researchers, archaeologist Dr. Camille Warden and climate scientist Professor Ian Cliff, whose controversial work earned them a Nobel Prize in December, have done just that. Apart from the Book of Revelation, their Atlantean climate change hypothesis is probably the best roadmap we've got in terms of showing us what we're in for. I caught up with them last week at the Climate su Summit in Cairo to ask them what's to be done if we're living through the same extreme climate change that led to the fall of Atlantis. So the interviewer poses the question, Dr. Warden, what's the context for your discoveries and why are people finally taking notice of the idea of Atlantis, long considered merely a myth? And Camille Warden replies, yes, it's true. For centuries, people have written about the myth, the meaning, the location and the fate of Atlantis, beginning with Plato's Timaeus, which inspired many others after him to propose alternative theories about Earth's mishaps. For example, books like Earth in Upheaval by Emmanuel Velikovsky, which was seen as heresy in the 1950s, and the work of Ignatius, Ignatius Donnelly, Atlantean, Atlantis and the Antidolite, antediluvian world which was regarded as historical fantasy long after it was published in 1882. Many researchers have tried to link flood myths with the fossil record and we're still in the process of piecing together the evidence provided by geological strata, ice cores and impact craters. We now know for sure how and when the dinosaurs were wiped out and the public is well aware there have been other mass extinction events but so far experts have been reluctant to say that humans were virtually wiped out too. I believe that's the real reason we've ignored Atlantis for so long. We've been in denial about what took place 12,000 years ago, but we're finally waking up to the fact that back then we almost became extinct too. So she asks, so is this the conclusion that your work has led you to, Professor Cliff? Well, it's not all doom and gloom. The Atlanteans were smart people. They saw it coming and they made a plan to not only survive the calamity, but miraculously also save much of their culture and technological know-how in the process. We have long known there were sudden advances in human civilization when we went from being primitive hunter-gatherers to having the kind of highly developed systems of writing, engineering, medicine, mathematics, etc. that you see in ancient Egypt and Mesopotamia. But this massive shift has never been properly accounted for. The truth is the Atlanteans probably seeded many survivor colonies. New Atlantis was really a legacy project, not a place. And we, know, we now think it led to the emergence not only of Egyptian culture, but also the Guanches, uh, in uh, the Canary Islands, the Basque people, the Mayans, and possibly many others. Professor Cliff, I understand you were initially sceptical of the extraterrestrial aspects of Dr. Warden's findings. Have you come to a new understanding of other forms of intelligence as a result of your collaboration? I have to admit the aliens and outer space factor challenged my credulity for a long time, given that we had no visible evidence. But the moment Camille's intern showed me how the Syrian disks had been encoded, I knew this was no terrestrial technology. I had to expand my thinking to realise that the Dogon people were not making it up. Their ancestral stories about having contact with beings from Sirius had always struck me as possible from a mathematical probability point of view. But seeing those disks for the first time, I knew it had to be true. Camille, your research team, led by Major Jonathan Edwards, now includes many other disciplines, including astronomers and paleolinguists, paleo quantum physicists, even shamans and spiritual media. To what extent has your willingness to overcome the boundaries of academic disciplines been the secret of your success? It's all about putting our heads together and being open-minded. 
that should be the approach of all scientific inquiry if we're to discover something we didn't know before, something that only our combined knowledge and perspective can shed, on, shed light on. It's been very exciting and at times challenging to work across our various disciplines since we all had our own ways of doing things, but it's taken us somewhere new for sure. The work we're presenting here at the Climate Summit, for instance, has meant that even the most stubborn Egyptologists are changing their mind about pre pharaonic culture and are finally coming to accept the antiqu antiquity of the Sphinx, the proof that it was eroded by water and the real reason for the building of the Great Pyramids. By holding the summit here in Cairo, we've been able to open up the Hall of Records and various other chambers beneath the Giza Plateau for the first time so that delegates can see for themselves what is being described in the accounts of Cam, Mel and Leon. Ian, your work is now the subject of a major touring exhibition called The New Atlantis, and soon people all around the world will be able to see the Dogon Scrolls, the Sphinx Codex and the Syrian Discs firsthand. What impact would you like these ancient documents to have on, human, on modern human consciousness? They've already had considerable impact. I thought at first their main impact would be to silence the people who accused us of conducting pseudoscience. But now we have unearthed the documents, translated the words and shed light on their meaning. The real impact will be measured by how quickly we as a species act. We know we're in the midst of a global catastrophe, but our findings show it is not unprecedented. We have faced climate change on this scale before. It is now up to the Intergovernmental Committee on Climate Change, as well as lobbyists and activists, to reorientate their agendas to take account of our Atlantean climate change hypothesis and secure enough funding to make the new Atlantis a living, breathing legacy project for today. And what would that entail exactly? Like the Atlanteans, we need to evacuate our people permanently away from vulnerable coastal locations. We need to build hundreds of new cities in safe locations and find novel ways to ensure our survival. There is already a seed vault in Svalbard, north of Norway, containing the means to grow food again should all our plant species be wiped out. But, and many museums have created watertight, impact-proof vaults to, sh to store important artworks and artefacts. But without our survival, this is all somewhat pointless. As individuals, we are not resilient. We are not as resilient as we would like to think we are. We do not have the practical life skills that our predecessors had. Many of those who survived climate change back then did so by virtue of being at high altitude with access to fresh water and natural shelter. We can do better than this. We have the insight and the intelligence to secure an, an even better outcome than the Atlanteans. Our survival doesn't have to be the case of being lucky enough to be in the right place at the right time. Lastly, what do your findings have to teach us about the future of renewable technology? We can all do our bit individually, sure, but it really it's down to big en energy companies doing more than simply committing to becoming carbon neutral in the next quarter century. It's going to take something a lot more visionary and joined up. First and foremost, what the Atlanteans can teach us is not, that there's, is not their strategic level of foresight, but their mastery and understanding of renewable energy. They were far more advanced at this than we are. The pyramids are not just extraordinary feats of construction. They were skillfully designed and built to harness, attenuate, balance and even distribute energy within the Earth's atmosphere. We don't need to build, we don't need to burn fossil fuels to obtain energy. According to our most radical scientists and engineers who believe we're living in an electric universe, we don't even need solar panels and wind turbines. We just need to tap into the flow of plasma and electrons in our upper atmosphere. If we do this, we can also boost Earth's magnetic field, much like boosting our own immune system and protect ourselves from solar flares, mass coronal injections and EMPs. We might even reduce the likelihood of anything impacting Earth and causing the sort of worldwide climate mayhem the Atlanteans had to contend with. The maths and the science have all been done. It's all up for grabs. We just need to implement it. I say us, but really it's the next generation. They're the ones who are really fired up and angry about our governments and industries in action. They've got the right idea. We just need to step aside now and let them get on with it. Awesome. So that's the sort of final word. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and what a great word to end on. Um, that's, that's awesome. Um, and yeah, while you were talking, um, it reminds me too of, um, I know that Atlantis is like the uh, framing tool for this novel, but um, in a previous podcast episode that I did um, when I was doing some research for it, um, I came across, um, it was a, um, a super volcano eruption that happened, I think, 74,000 years ago. You may have heard of it. Um, the Toba volcano mm -hmm. erupted, yeah, I think in Indonesia. And um, 
obviously there's a lot of things we don't know about it because it happened so long ago, but, you know, some theories say that it caused um, effectively like uh, a winter sort of um, to last for like six to 10 years after that happened and mm. probably wiped out a lot of people, but like we managed yeah. to step back from that too. So, yeah. It's the same. Uh, it's the same volcano. I, I think I'm right in saying it's the same volcano that erupted in 1815 and caused what yeah. they call the year without a summer. Mm. Yeah, yeah, I think so. It's. I think it's erupted a few different times during. Yeah. This, but yeah. And that, that was, um, I think I also read that. I mean, if you believe um, Atlantis, of course, the next step you need to go to is: Did you believe in Lemuria? And some yeah. people think that possibly the the Toba volcano might have been what wiped out um, Lemuria or contributed to the destruction of that civilization. Yeah, I don't think I've actually heard of Lemuria, so I'll have to look into that. Um, that's interesting. Um, but yeah, cool. Thank you so much for reading that. I uh, really appreciate that. And I okay. loved hearing it, uh, right in your voice. So um, yeah, if you still have time, I'd, I have a couple more questions. I'd yeah, like to absolutely. Through. I'd love to answer them. Yeah, so um, like I mentioned before, like the Earth is, the Earth's climate has changed many different times throughout history. Um, and there are some theories that, um, you know, so, some scientific theories that, um, try to, I guess, like imagine how that might have changed our own biological evolution as a species. Um, so now that we're faced with anthropogenic climate change um, on an unprecedented scale, uh, some scientists are also trying to, I guess, imagine how that might be changing our own evolution now. Um, but in the past, you know, like these climatic changes have happened over the course of thousands of years, which uh, theoretically would give us time to adapt to them as they're happening but now you know like there's that famous graph that i feel like everybody always sees where it's like study study and then shoop, like mm -hmm. right around like the 1950s or whatever it was uh, right after the industrial revolution um so in your book like you talk a lot about i think uh, cam mel and leon being genetically engineered or modified in some way um do you see that as um maybe something that might be necessary or um, just like an example of how we might have to get really creative. About yeah, I mean, I think what I wanted to do with the, the genetic modification was um, use it as a way to show how advanced the Atlantean civilization was, you know, okay. not that that's a kind of, you know, not that that's a sort of a uh, form of, of any sort of indicator of, of civilization, but it's obviously you have to be pretty sophisticated to be able to manipulate DNA um, at that level. So Mm. But I wanted it. To, I wanted the whole take on genetic modification to be somewhat ambivalent um, through the through the whole book um, and have and be fraught with some sort of ethical issues. So you weren't seeing it as being a kind of technological solution that the reader necessarily or some of the characters were going to be comfortable with um, okay. just because it's been um, put in action. Put, you know, the whole pro project is a kind of secret fail safe project. So mm -hmm. the very fact that it was secret seems to indicate that they knew there was something a little bit kind of dodgy about it if you like um, <laughs> yeah. and, and not, not altogether um, uh, sort of sanctioned by the community that was you know because obviously is they, they're kind of like a, a species of human being developed to be more resilient should should actual humans not survive and so they right. may be able to breed and repopulate the earth because um, King Atlas it, it's obvious he's aware that that was a, a, a particular problem the last time a uh, severe climate change uh, kind of got hold of uh, the planet and mm -hmm. he, he's, he's looking for some novel ways. Yeah. So he's definitely, he's definitely kind of scratching around for some sort of fairly drastic ways of, of mitigating um, the possibility that they might be wiped out. Um, yeah. I mean, obviously uh, as, as it, as it kind of progresses, you know, the, the three characters, first of all, they, they, they're quite slow to kind of cotton onto the fact that they, they are chameleonoid and they have and it's taken form in different ways for each of the three of them so they're, they're all kind of developed slightly differently um and it, in a way it kind of takes them a while to get control of their special skills or to come to terms with their special skills and the fact that they're different from other people so i'm hoping that readers will find that quite a relatable uh, issue that they're, they're dealing with and then once they realize um, that they have these skills they can kind of put them to good use they can start to you know improvise with them and um, 
find ways that you know ways around you know they get, give them interesting workarounds to particular problems um and then you know in the final p part of the story when the three of them come together and they're really trying to defeat and, and fend off some some big kind of problems both human and kind of um environmental there it's only their combined uh, skill sets of their chameleon eye qualities that enable them to to kind of uh, sort of triumph over that situation um bit by bit and by sort of trial and error so it's, it gave me some very interesting um scope to deal with you know that i wanted you to experience as a reader what it feels like to have a different body type and to kind of have to transition in and out of uh, a, a different shape of a body or in a different timeline or um to kind of experience the future a little bit ahead or to be able to telepathize you know these are things that are standard tropes in a lot of science fiction literature but often the kind of experiential aspects aren't aren't um there's not a lot of detail if you like you know so that the reader isn't kind of given that um uh, sense of what it you know what it would be like to experience those um those kind of super superpowers i suppose mm -hmm. yeah that's cool and it also kind of reminds me of if there are like movements now like transhumanism movements that are already sort of trying to imagine you know like how we will need to adapt our like physical bodies mm. uh, through technology yeah. Uh, so, yeah it's very interesting and i think definitely very timely um and then also kind of on the topic of I guess using uh, high technology to um, modify, you know, like ourselves or our environment. Um, something it also brings to mind is geoengineering, uh, which has kind of been a hot topic in the past couple of years. Um, I think Yale Environment 360 has said that um, a growing number of scientists are saying that geoengineering is going to have to be, um, I guess, a, a tool that we or a weapon that we keep in our arsenal to, uh, I guess. Uh, adapt to the changing climate and to try to mitigate it as uh, climate change intensifies. Um, but I know that when I first heard about it, I was like, there's no way that we're going to do geoengineering. That sounds like something out of, you know, like a science fiction movie or something. Mm -hmm. um, and to anybody not familiar with geoengineering, uh, I think the idea is basically that we would be shooting aerosols into the atmosphere to um, sort of reflect some of the sun's rays that are shooting down on earth to sort of um, reduce the effect of the greenhouse effect, which naturally already occurs on earth. Um, so as an author who has yeah. previously written science fiction, who deals with a lot of science fiction elements uh, like genetically modified people, um, how do you feel about massive technological interventions like geoengineering? Um, I know you said like in your book, Chameleon, it is kind of like a, a squeamish kind of topic like people are not really sure if it's totally ethical but you know like might it get bad enough that we have to do that you know like what are your mm. thoughts on that well my thoughts on that are that um what we read in the mainstream is usually about t science and technology is usually um we usually have the technology that's far in advance of that you know yeah. um so what we're told about now is probably what we actually had back in the sort of 1980s or something um yeah. and that's you know we have a lot of for good reason you know and partly out the back of the cold war as well you know there's a kind of a space race there's a an, a need for black black ops projects i guess you can kind of justify sometimes uh, so i i think anytime you get involved with writing about science fiction there's you you, you do engage with some conspiracy theories and um creatively creatively and imaginatively so uh, my my interest in in kind of way out theories is just you know how do you kind of make your your own fiction more lively and um, more kind of controversial in a way you know i'm aware that this book is yeah. quite controversial and i think that deliberately so because i'm hoping that that will be a way that will provoke conversations and it's really lovely to have a conversation with someone like you forest who's kind of open to these ideas and mm. interested in them yourself yeah. but, but i tend to think that um from what i've read anyway is that um, we're already doing geo geoengineering and the fact that they're now admitting that we might have to do it is the kind mm. of drip, drip, drip kind of start of that um, letting the public know that it's already well underway. So I don't know if you mm. know much about HARP, but um, no. HARP was a was a, a project that based out of uh, Alaska where they had an array that could, you know, basically squirt, as you say, aerosolized um, substances up into the 
um, up into the ionosphere to try and dampen down the effect of global warming and kind of dim the light coming in and thereby reduce the, the surface temperatures of the sea and, the, and so on. Um, mm. Now, that project has actually rep reportedly been closed down now, and it's just a kind of part of Fairbanks University in Alaska, um, okay. continuing some of the work. Um, but I've also read that in China, there are 37,000 people in employed to do geoengineering projects and research now, yeah. as of now. That was a, an article I read just a week ago. Um, so it's not just the States. Uh, it's not just um, not just NASA, let's say, who are interested yeah. in these things. And, I, and I, there was an episode, really interestingly, in 2015, I think there was an episode of Top Gear, where oh, okay. um, Jeremy Clarkson <laughs> showed how um, NASA had the power to create weather storms and massive clouds, you know, and kind of seed clouds and seed weather systems. Oh. And it was really interesting, the pushback they got after that, that NASA strenuously denied it. And there was a lot of debunking. And, um, yeah. and any time you sort of see that happening, you kind of think, OK, you got a bit too close to the truth and it got it, too much truth kind of leaked out just then. You know, they, yeah. they all say that NASA stands for ne never a straight answer. So I found all that really intriguing. <laughs> yeah. um, and I think that we could, yes, we could find that um, the public has a high level of... Um, acceptability now around the idea of geoengineering when they start to see that their very livelihoods you know this massive re relocation for example that i'm talking about that might be necessary yeah. uh, in china they've built a lot of spare cities on the high plateau of the gobi desert and you wonder why they've done that well maybe they've done that because they can kind of see what's coming and other countries haven't really wrapped their heads around it as, as much just yet or had the resources to do something as on a scale like that but um, if people are resistant to the idea of moving away from coastal locations, then we're going to have to try some other things. But I do think that, you know, if you know anything about chaos theory, that if you start to play God and interfere with with big meteorological systems, you know, we know that the jet stream is permanently messed up now, probably by by our own actions. Then we don't know. We, we can kind of have all these theories and we can model it and computer models and so on and show what we think that the the, the, the weather modification effect might be that might be you know to improve things but it might make things very much worse and that's the yep. that's the risk you're going to take <laughs> <laughs> and um so i tend to think that chaos theory is is, is such an unpredictable mm -hmm. uh and in, there's so many moving parts let's say so it's such an interconnected issue that you're talking about that um yeah. it sounds it sounds dangerous to me and i wouldn't be a fan of it yeah i kind of feel the same way <laughs> yeah and then, of course you know when you're squirting bits of aluminium and things like that into the upper atmosphere there are lots of health potential hazards as well aren't there sure. so yeah. uh, you know i mean I'm, I'm not sure the jury's out for me on the chemtrailing and stuff but there are a lot of people who feel that that's you know that's possibly aerosolizing at a lower level you know more in our troposphere than in the upper yeah. ionosphere that um that that's already seeded a lot of heavy metals into our atmosphere that shouldn't be there so yeah i mean i would say you know nature usually has a has a fix for its own problems and uh, we just need to be a bit patient and and stop stop making things very much worse for a start yeah totally agree with that um that's i think something that most people can agree on um but yeah i have um not to i guess stay too long on this topic but yeah i have um i've read a lot about geoengineering i mean i'm not a scientist myself i don't come from a scientific background but um there are some interesting i guess sort of scenarios that some people have put forth like well we think like geoengineering will you know help in general but it also could like if we don't do it correctly or i guess if we do it at all or you know if we think we're doing it correctly and like as you said like chaos theory plays into it um we could like accidentally make like low-lying countries and like southeast asia just go underwater if we do mm -hmm. it incorrectly mm -hmm. um, or we could just completely screw up their weather and make it um unlivable so there's some people have been like oh this could start wars like you know it's going to displace like millions of people so uh, it's definitely uh, still, I think, a pretty controversial topic, but mm. it's something that still interests me mm. <laughs> for that matter. But um, yeah. No, thank uh, you for bringing it up because not many people, yeah. uh, you know, these, these are things at the edges, you know, it's all fringe technology, basically. And we, yeah. we love to watch Netflix, you know, kind of box <laughs> sets and all that about these things. But then when it, when it comes to being about our real, you know, our actual lives and our actual circumstances, people are quite reluctant to kind of to talk about it, funnily enough. Yeah, yeah. 
and it is something that is very real. Like, as you said, and uh, there are people researching it right now. I, I know that I mentioned Yale earlier, but I know that Yale is researching actively, you know, how to pull mm. up geoengineering. Yeah. Um, and there's a new unit, I think, at the University of Cambridge called the yeah. Climate Repair Centre, isn't there, that is kind of supposedly you know trying to address some things with a more lateral perspective which is kind of what i'm speculating about in the story with uh, the the modern part of the story yeah yeah i'm sure there is that's interesting um okay cool well uh switching gears a little bit from i guess the more science aspects of your book um i think ultimately the thing that makes climate fiction um powerful and interesting as i guess like a literary subgenre is that it deals with like the human condition impacts of climate change and i i guess like any um good work of literature is um really just an inquiry into the human condition um so i'm i'm wondering um i guess like what are the um like how does the human condition play into fighting climate change and uh you know like how does this impact our strategies for resilience mm. Yeah, well, I mean, as I indicated, you know, the main thing that we need to be resilient about is um, actually admitting to ourselves that we have been possibly more than once nearly wiped out, nearly made extinct. Um, mm. I think one of the reasons why it's taken us a long while to um, to actually kind of come to terms with the instantaneity or the rapidity that climate change is ramping up really steeply is because um, geology and a lot of a lot of science basically is kind of based on an idea of gradualism you know the whole of evolution is a very gradual gradual you know process of, of adaptation and modification and and um, you know back in the early days when geology was sort of first being um, thought through if you like as a kind of field of study you know that that gradual uniformitarianism i think it was called was was you know the order of the day so catastrophism the idea that things can happen like that you know was really ruled out even even as recently as the 1950s and yet um as the as the polar ice caps melt and we discover these mammoths uh, up in siberia um mm. you know that kind of come out of the come out of the ice and um you know their their flesh is still fresh enough that the dogs who found them could eat it and not get ill and then mm. when they've examined these mammoths they found that they were clearly flash frozen because they had undigested uh, food in their mouths and in their stomachs so it obviously kind oh. of took them by surprise and what the, the species of plants that are in their mouths and stomachs don't grow in Siberia so they obviously at that moment occupied a different temperate region mm. so something really something really uh, serious happened um and that was you know that was what caused the the extinction of the the megafauna 12,000 years ago so the mammoths and the saber-toothed tigers and the giant sloths and all that um and and nearly us too but for the foresight of the atlanteans as i would have it <laughs> so uh, yeah that's the first point is you know we've got to be part of being resilient is not turning a blind eye and not putting our head in the sand and not kind of going la 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 this isn't happening mm. Um, yeah. which I think we're kind of, you know, starting to do now. I think there's less issue, less of an issue of climate change denial than there was even five years ago, which is, right. which is good. Um, and I think also what I wanted to do was, I, I'm aware that when you write something that is about catastrophism, you know, when we think about most disaster movies, sometimes, um, sometimes the human, human nature prevails, doesn't it? And kind of, you know, they sure. triumph over it. But often it's seen as, you know, that extreme example of victimhood where it doesn't matter what the humans do, it's hopeless, you know, they're fighting a losing battle. And um, well, I wanted to instill that sense of hope at the end of the story, you know, that mm. the Atlanteans with some clever planning did survive and um, went on to do amazing things. And, see, you know, if we have it, if you believe what I'm saying, then they seeded the Egyptian culture and possibly the Mayan culture and others as well. So they clearly survived you know without being re re without having to revert to being cavemen uh primitive you know peoples i mean elsewhere in the world yes where we weren't as sophisticated it was kind of back to that sort of level of normality so yeah. so that's you know that's really the kind of first step in the in the journey i think to being super resilient um is to mm. say yes we were nearly wiped out but we have more than we have more than enough resources to uh, see the outcome turn out slightly differently this time around and that's where the sense of hope comes into it for me so maybe you know mm -hmm. I think 
part of our collective memory, if you like, the reason we find it so traumatic to have to think about these things, and I think the reason we've clung on to the idea that Atlantis was a myth for such a long time is because it's quite hard to reconcile ourselves to the idea that those sorts of, you know, that kind of enormity of what must have happened really did take place. Sure. Um, so, so, you know, we're doing battle with our cognitive dissonance all the time. And mm. if fiction can break through that and kind of help us be OK with it, then, you know, that's that's, I guess, the contribution I want to make. Yeah, no, that's awesome. Um, and I think, um, too, like on that note, um, I know a lot of people are, um, I guess, trying to kind of draw parallels to the COVID-19 pandemic. And a lot of people are saying, like, oh, this is kind of like an example of what climate change and uh, you know, in like fast motion would look like. Um, and mm -hmm. I was just reading yesterday about, um, you know, how a lot of people now are feeling numb about the pandemic. Um, and I am like kind of feeling that a little bit too, but um, there's something called like empathy fatigue where, you know, mm -hmm. like we can only, I guess, kind of let ourselves feel like the really painful emotions of catastrophe, like to a certain extent. Um, and I think like for a lot of people, I was definitely in that camp, like back when this was first going on, like earlier, at least in the United States in the spring, um, you know, like when the situation in New York City was really, really bad and, you know, you just see like mm -hmm. these massive casualties and stuff that was really, really heartbreaking. And I remember just like, you know, there would be like days when I just like could hardly function because it was just so overcome with like the grief of, you know, like all the suffering that this was causing. Um, but yeah, I'm wondering if that is sort of also happening now with climate change. And like, as you pointed out, like the, um, I guess the problem of climate denial has um, become much less of a problem in the past five years. And, you know, public support for taking action on climate change has gone up significantly in that amount of time, which is really great. Um, but yeah, I, um, it's, uh, I think it's really helpful for us to like look back yeah. at examples like Atlantis and, you know, like, just remind ourselves that this isn't just going to go away because we're tired of hearing about it. Um, mm. You know, this is something that we really have to contest with. So I'm um, glad that you're bringing attention to that. Um, and I think we don't have time for it. I did have one last question, but um, maybe really quick, we could touch on it. Okay, um, cool. I know that I've got a timer at the top, but um, like, I know that, uh, you know, climate change is a really distressing topic for a lot of people. Um, climate fiction, I think, can help people sort of cope with it has writing climate fiction helped you at all in you know your personal feelings about climate change yeah i think so i mean obviously i i stumbled into it so i didn't kind of think sure. oh ho, i'm feeling terrible about this i need to write a you know piece of fiction that sort of to, to help me kind of come to terms with it but it has i guess had that had that effect um mm -hmm. and i've talked already about this sort of sense of hopelessness um yeah Particularly about the, you know, when I discovered that the Intergovernmental Committee on Climate Change really only, uh, you know, sort of charts what's happening and proposes measures, but doesn't actually have any impetus or any kind of, you know, teeth, if you like, to kind of force it through. We don't really have a way to, to kind of put things into motion and really implement things beyond, you know, each individual country. Um, but I think what Chameleon, writing Chameleon in particular, what it's helped me do is, is see things in a bigger picture, you know, so not only from a, a way off, you know, so from outside of our solar system. And by mm -hmm. the way, you know, it, it, some people would say that there is climate change happening on every single planet in our solar system. So it's not all down to us, you know, quite a lot of what we've done on this planet is because of what we've done in terms of being. Hey, Sarah. Hey. Hey, I'm sorry we got disconnected. That was my fault. No, no, it's my fault. I wasn't very snappy with my answer. <laughs> no worries. No worries at all. Um, yeah, so I think I was asking you, like, what kind of impact has writing climate fiction um, had on you personally? Yeah, I, I mean, what I was what I was trying to say uh, was that <laughs> it's given me a, a, a bigger kind of perspective on everything, really. Um, most of all, writing Chameleon, um, not just from the kind of view of thinking about from outside of this solar system, from outside of our own planet, from outside of our own solar system, but also a different sense of the timeline. So when you're writing a story that's set 12,000 years ago and you're aware that maybe these things have happened previous to that as well, uh, you know, over a kind of massive um, span of time, then it does sort of, it just puts in, things into perspective. And um, sometimes that can be very overwhelming and, and, and sort of, you know, the true sense of the word awesome, isn't it? You know, yeah. um, on the other hand, I also find it quite reassuring that we are, we are just um, a species on a planet 
yeah. dealing with all the things that gets thrown at us and uh, we, we each each iteration of that that species surviving on a planet is going to have its own um coping strategies and um and we're working out what ours are yeah well that's awesome thank you for sharing your thoughts with us and for going live i apologize for some of the technical difficulties we had at the beginning there but we figured it out we did we did that's just me being such a newbie to all this so thank yeah. you for with me <laughs> yeah i am a newbie too so no worries at all well, awesome. I think that wraps up our first uh, Stories for Earth Instagram Live uh, with Sarah Holding. And um, yeah, we will post this on IGTV afterwards so you can view on demand. And uh, Sarah, thank you so much for joining us again. Thank you so much, Forrest. It's been my pleasure. All right. Well, it's been great talking to you. I hope you have a great rest of your day. I'll talk to you soon. Talk to you soon. Bye-bye now. Bye.